Good afternoon. In this talk, I'll be focusing on the sacrifice of Adam and Eve as recounted in the book of Moses, chapter 5, verses 4 through 15. This is part of the book of Moses' narrative of the redemption of Adam and Eve following their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, an account which is completely absent from the parallel parts of the received text of Genesis. This account begins immediately following the notice of Adam and Eve working and having children, the portion of the text corresponding to Genesis 4.1, and Adam knew Eve, his wife. In Moses 5, 4 through 8, we read of Adam and Eve receiving divine communications and offering sacrifice. And Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, and they heard the voice of the Lord from the way toward the Garden of Eden, speaking unto them. And they saw him not, for they were shut out from his presence. And he gave unto them commandments, that they should worship the Lord their God, and should offer the first things of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. And after many days, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Adam, saying, Why dost thou offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, save the Lord commanded me. And then the angel spake, saying, This thing is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, which is full of grace and truth. Wherefore, thou shalt do all that thou doest in the name of the Son, and thou shalt repent and call upon God in the name of the Son forevermore. The text goes on to say that the Holy Ghost fell upon Adam and instructed him about the promise of redemption through the only begotten after which Adam began to prophesy concerning his posterity, and he and Eve rejoiced. As Adam and Eve began to teach their posterity about these things, Satan came among their posterity and presented his own contrary doctrine, and they loved Satan more than God, the text says, thereby becoming carnal, sensual, and devilish. The Holy Ghost then called upon people everywhere and commanded them to repent. These events are summarized at the end of the chapter in Moses 5, verses 58 through 59. And thus the gospel began to be preached from the beginning, being declared by holy angels sent forth from the presence of God, and by his own voice, and by the gift of the Holy Ghost. And thus all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance, and the gospel preached, and a decree sent forth that it should be in the world until the end thereof. And thus it was. Amen. Ancient Jewish, Christian, and Islamic literature contains many variations on the theme of the repentance and redemption of Adam and Eve after their expulsion from the garden. Many of the narratives are similar to the one in Moses 5, 4 through 15, including any number of the following elements found in the Moses passage. Adam and Eve offering prayer, God speaking to Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve offering sacrifices, and heavenly messengers instructing Adam and Eve. The order of these elements varies from one text to another, according to the logic of the narrative. For instance, in some cases, Adam and Eve offer sacrifice only after being instructed to do so by a heavenly messenger. However, in all cases, the elements function together within the narrative as the process by which Adam and Eve return from their fallen state to a state of favor with God. Other elements recurring in these narratives include attempts by Satan to thwart Adam and Eve through temptation, combat, or deception, Adam and Eve receiving a divine assurance that they can obtain salvation, Adam and Eve rejoicing in their redemption, and Adam prophesying of his posterity. Each of these elements has parallels in the book of Moses. The ancient extra-biblical literature on Adam and Eve is immense, especially if we include texts beyond standalone narratives, such as commentaries, magical texts, historical works, and homilies. Not all texts have the key elements found in the Book of Moses. This slide shows the texts I surveyed in my research for this paper, all of which are discussed in the published version. Of these 16 texts, only four are especially close to the Book of Moses, containing all of the key elements. I'll be focusing on these four in this presentation. These include the Book of Jubilees, the medieval Jewish Sefer Raziel, 
the Christian Arabic conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan, and al Kisa'i's collection of Islamic stories of the prophets. Especially these last three contain all of the key elements. The Book of Jubilees has only one of them. Before proceeding, I should clarify the approach I am taking in comparing the Book of Moses with the ancient Adam literature. Given a group of texts with similar features, at least two models might be used to compare them. The more traditional one, and perhaps the one that comes most readily to mind, is the intertextual stemma model. According to this model, there is a relatively small number of original texts based ultimately on the Bible and the rest of the existing literature consists of redactions from these originals. The precise mode of transmission may be written, oral, or a combination of the two. This model lies behind Michael E. Stone's book, A History of the Literature of Adam and Eve. This slide shows an intertextual stemma for the Adam literature. This one is from a book by Roger W. Cowley. Texts may also be related to each other typologically. That is, they may share certain features which place them in a common category of text. A typological model is appropriate for comparing texts that are not necessarily historically related, but that nevertheless show similar features, such as the Book of Moses and the Quran. Both are revealed texts that include stories about ancient prophets. However, the intertextual and typological models are not mutually exclusive, for two texts can be related both by derivation and by typological similarity. Typological comparisons are useful because they shed light on aspects of a text that are not easily explained by means of derivation alone, such as the relationship between a text's content and its zitzim leben, or setting in life. In this paper, I take a typological approach in comparing the Book of Moses with ancient apocryphal literature. In addition to yielding new insights into the topic at hand, I find this approach appealing because it allows the comparison of texts from diverse linguistic traditions and time periods without the need for speculative assumptions about historical relationships among the texts. This approach is also especially conducive to scholarly dialogue about the Book of Moses, since it foregrounds the objective insights to be gained from the book, insights which are equally informative for the ancient literature. My intention in this paper is twofold. First, to review the main textual sources that show similarities to the Moses account. And second, to take the comparative question to a deeper level and explore what the similarities and differences between the accounts can tell us about the cultural history of religious narrative. I will argue that some of the ancient narratives of Adam and Eve, along with the Book of Moses, represent a specific type of text crafted to present the origin of a ritual or group of rituals. Further, the likeness and form between these narratives is related to this likeness and function. In other words, the motifs that are present in the Book of Moses and in these other ancient texts are motifs that tend to support a ritual performance by giving it authority and efficacy. Perhaps the earliest surviving narrative describing what Adam and Eve did after they were driven out of the Garden of Eden is found in the Book of Jubilees. This book was composed in Hebrew, likely in the second century BC. It is therefore contemporary with the Jewish Second Temple, Fragments of the book were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. However, the majority of the narrative is known primarily from the Ethiopic version. The Book of Jubilees is framed as a revelation to Moses on Mount Sinai at the time when he received the Tablets of the Law, which is a common apocryphal motif, by the way. The book is also oriented to ritual concerns. At many points, the narrative is explicitly connected with the law written on the heavenly tablets, the same ones that contain the law of Moses. For instance, after describing the sacrifice of Noah on the first day of the third month, the text states, therefore it is ordained and written in the heavenly tablets that they should observe the feast of Shavuot, that is the feast of weeks or Pentecost in this month, once per year 
in order to renew the covenant in all respects year by year. The law is thus performed as eternal, and the history is presented as mythological precedent for present observance. In Jubilees 3, verses 27 through 31, just after exiting the Garden of Eden wearing his garment of animal skins, Adam makes an offering of incense and spices to God. The mention of a sweet smell here, while appropriate for the incense, also evokes biblical descriptions of animal sacrifice. This offering is mentioned as a precedent to a law in the heavenly tablets, which decrees that God's covenant people should cover their shame, unlike the Gentiles. This alludes to the Lord's commandment in Exodus 28 that, one offering sacrifice at the altar cover his nakedness. Note that the Hebrew word for the garment covering Aaron and his sons is the same word used for Adam's coat of skins in Genesis 3. Thus, one who offers sacrifice in the temple follows the pattern established by Adam when he offered sacrifice after covering his nakedness. Very strong parallels to the Book of Moses are found in Sefer Raziel, a magical text dating to the 13th century AD at the latest, but first known from a version printed in Amsterdam in 1701. The book itself contains various recipes and formulas for all sorts of purposes, including predicting the future. The prologue, however, explains how the book was revealed by the angel Raziel to Adam shortly after his expulsion from the garden. The prologue begins with an account of Adam's prayer, which he offered at the time when he was driven out of the Garden of Eden, before this holy book, meaning the book of Raziel itself, was given him. Adam's prayer is quite long. Here is a brief excerpt from the climax of the prayer. And now, O most compassionate and merciful God, Return to your first formed, to the spirit that you inbreathed, to the soul that you gave. May my prayer come up before the throne of your glory, and may my cry reach the throne of your mercy, that you may grant me your favor, and may the words of my mouth be accepted before you. The text continues. After three days of his supplications, presumably meaning that he repeated the prayer three times, the angel Raziel came to him while he was sitting by the river that went forth from the Garden of Eden. And he appeared to him during the time when the sun is hottest, and in his hand was a book. And he said to him, to him, Adam, why are you desolate? Why do you grieve in sorrow? From the day that you stood in prayer and supplications, your words were heard, and I have come to cause you to understand pure promises and great wisdom. The angel goes on to explain, every man, or in the Hebrew, every Adam, of his children who will stand in his place, who follow the teachings of the book, will have knowledge of the future, and all things shall be revealed to him. Although sacrifice is not mentioned in the introductory narrative, the ritual instructions that follow, which are designed to imitate what Adam did to receive his angelic visitation, include elaborate rites of purification and sacrifice. This implies that Adam, too, purified himself and performed sacrifices at the time he offered his prayer. In this text, Adam's actions are the precedent that show how individual owners of the book can access its power. Perhaps the closest parallel to Moses 5, 4 through 15 in all of ancient literature is the Christian Arabic text known as the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan. The text dates to between the 8th and 9th centuries AD. An Ethiopic version translated from the Arabic was produced around the 11th century. The conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan begins with a brief description of the geography of the area surrounding paradise. Then it launches into a narrative of the expulsion of Adam and Eve and the things that happened to them afterwards. This text brings up the ancient apocryphal motif of the cave of treasures, the place where Adam and Eve dwell and where they receive gifts from heavenly messengers. 
The text is organized around Adam and Eve's excursions from the cave, during which Satan continually tries to thwart them from obtaining salvation. The conflict of Adam and Eve includes many references to prayers and other communications between the first parents and God. But the most significant parallels to the book of Moses are in the two sacrifices that they offer during their second and 17th excursions from the cave. On their second excursion, Adam and Eve try to climb up the mountain to re-enter paradise. As they draw near to the western door of paradise and weep there, they feel the heat of paradise burn their faces. The heat is so intense that first Adam and then Eve throw themselves down from the height and lie there bleeding until God's, God uh, sends his voice to raise them up. Then Adam and Eve offer their first sacrifice. First, they take rocks and make an altar. Then they take leaves from outside paradise, anoint them with their own blood from the ground where they had fallen, and lift up these offerings upon the altar. Then they stand at the foot of the altar, weeping and beseeching God for mercy. God responds by sending a brilliance, in Arabic a nurania, from his presence that burns the offering. He smells the sweet savor and has pity on Adam and Eve. He then sends his voice and tells Adam about his own coming in the flesh and his own sacrifice that will happen, in which his blood will be shed on the altar for the forgiveness of sins. The narrator then says that Adam continues to perform this sacrifice as a regular observance. In their second sacrifice, Adam and Eve return to the altar on which they offered their blood in the first sacrifice, bearing wheat from a nearby field. Having offered the wheat on the altar, Adam and Eve stand and pray, to God, pray for God to accept their sacrifice. God replies to them, As you have made these sacrifices and have lifted them up to me, I will do thus with my body in the time when I descend to the earth, and I will save you. I will make it an everlasting offering lifted up upon the altar for forgiveness and mercy to those who worthily partake of it. The text continues, then God sent a spiritual fire upon Adam's offering and filled it with radiance and glory, and the light which fell upon the sacrifice is the Holy Spirit. God commands an angel to administer some of the sacrifice to Adam and Eve, and finally he commands Adam and Eve to observe this sacrifice as a regular custom. The next section explains how Adam and Eve organized the sacrifice to perform it three days a week, including Sunday, and make the offering while praying with stretched forth hands. The sacrifices of blood and wheat in the conflict of Adam and Eve correspond to the wine and bread of the Eucharist. A few points help to illustrate how the text develops the sacrifices as a precedent for the Eucharist in the same way that the Book of Moses develops Adam's animal offering as a precedent for temple sacrifice. First, the text makes use of several Arabic words that have double meanings. The word for sacrifice, korban, is also used in Arabic for the Christian Eucharist. The word for a temple and its altar, haikal, is also known to apply to the offering table for the Eucharist. And the word for what the angel does to Adam and Eve, haraba, in a general, in a generic sense, means to bring near or cause to approach. But as a technical term, it can also mean either to present a sacrificial offering or, in Christian contexts, to give communion to a worshiper. And uh, where the text says that the Holy Spirit is what falls upon the bread. That's an allusion to the epiclesis or the calling down of the Holy Spirit to sanctify the, um, the Eucharist uh, bread and wine. Second, note that God specifically likens the sacrifice to his own atoning sacrifice in the flesh, much like the angel's explanation to Adam in the book of Moses, that his sacrifice is a similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten. Third, note that there are explicit descriptions of the sacrifice becoming a permanent custom. This sets up the narrative as an origin story for the current practice of the Eucharist. This may be compared with the statement in Moses 5.59, 
that the holy ordinance given to Adam should be in the world until the end thereof. In this text, Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden westward, reversing the Hebrew Bible statement that the cherubim are placed at the east, implying that they are cast out eastward. The feature of Adam and Eve being cast out toward the west is also found in other Eastern Christian apocryphal narratives, such as the Hexameron of Pseudo-Epiphanius. This relates to the fact that Christian churches have their door facing west, unlike the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, whose door faced east. This is parallel to the spatial organization of the ritual of sacrifice at the Temple of Solomon, as we see in the Book of Jubilees and in the Book of Moses. Just as a priest entering the temple would symbolically reverse the fall to return into God's presence, passing the cherubim that decorated the doors, Christian worshipers would pray toward the east and approach toward the east for communion, thus also symbolically reversing the fall. Thus, the conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan effectively sets up Adam's sacrifice west of the garden as a precedent for the Christian Eucharist, just as Jubilees and the Book of Moses set up Adam's sacrifice as a precedent for temple sacrifice. Islamic literature takes a deep interest in Adam, who is regarded as the first prophet of Islam. The Quran contains several passages that describe Adam's exalted premortality, his transgression with Eve in paradise, and his expulsion and subsequent redemption. This is expanded considerably in the tafsir, or Quranic commentary tradition, which also incorporates material from Jewish and Christian lore. Between the 8th and the 14th centuries AD, the Islamic world saw the development of a genre of literature known as Qisas al anbiya or Stories of the Prophets, recounting extra-canonical stories about biblical and Quranic prophets. The work of the semi-legendary storyteller Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Kisai, who lived around the 12th century, is especially rich with material about Adam's redemption more than other transmitters of stories of the prophets, although it also contains many of the same elements as the others. As al kisai tells it, after the expulsion, God commands Adam to worship him and to pray. Stretch forth thy hands and call upon me, for I am nigh and responsive. Adam and Eve then descend to earth. Gabriel is sent by God to teach Adam sacred words, which he is to use in a prayer. God then, then uh, forgives Adam in a dramatic way reminiscent of temple motifs. The angel Gabriel then instructs Adam concerning the building of the Kaaba in Mecca and the performance of pilgrimage rites. Gabriel clothes Adam with two robes of heavenly brocade. He takes Adam by the hand and circumambulates the house seven times, teaches him all the rites of pilgrimage, and makes him stand at all the stations. Only then is Adam's redemption complete. In this text, Adam's redemption is explicitly connected to later observance of the pilgrimage rites at Mecca. Adam is the builder of the house, that is, the Kaaba, and the first one to perform the rites there, which include purifications, ritual clothing, circumambulation, and prayer. This is very much like the connection between Adam's redemption and later ritual performances in Sefer Raziel and the conflict of Adam and Eve, although each of these has its own distinctive religious orientation. As we see from this survey, there are texts with significant similarities to Moses 5 in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic literature. The three closest sources, Sefer Raziel, the combat of Adam and Eve, or the conflict of Adam and Eve, and al kisais stories of the prophets, are all relatively late. Most of the earlier apocryphal texts, including Midrashic literature, the Greek life of Adam and Eve, the cave of treasures, and the earlier transmitters of the stories of the prophets, are less like the Book of Moses. 
This presents us with a very interesting problem from the standpoint of the textual tradition, namely that the closest comparanda to the Book of Moses are the later texts. Of course, it is possible that these later texts preserve older threads of narrative that do not survive in older manuscripts or that have not been discovered yet. But it is difficult to build an argument on this assumption. Not only is the textual history of the Apocrypha notoriously difficult to untangle, but the Book of Moses itself, as both ancient and modern scripture, is very difficult to fit into a specific textual history. Ultimately, the search for intertextual relationships leaves us in the realm of the suggestive, with no concrete conclusions. Overall, this approach gives us very little basis for scholarly dialogue. I believe that a more solid comparison between the Book of Moses and the ancient Apocrypha is possible by taking a typological approach. This approach begins with the observation that the Book of Moses and its closest comparanda share one salient feature other than the similarity in contexts, uh, or in contents, rather. They are all oriented in a specific way to ritual performances. The Book of Moses in chapters five through six provides a doctrinal basis for the law of sacrifice and the ordinance of baptism. The book also lays out in textual form the pattern of expulsion from paradise, repentance, and being brought back into God's presence, which pattern the temple endowment embodies. We have seen that Jubilees similarly establishes precedents for ritual observances, particularly those connected with the calendar of feasts. Sefer Raziel and the Syriac Book of Protection are both magical texts that cite events in Adam's life as a basis for the use of the book itself to exert power over the supernatural world. The Arabic conflict of Adam and Eve with Satan establishes a precedent for the Christian Eucharist, which is precisely analogous to the sacrificial ritual with Christ-centered meaning described in Moses 5, 4 through 15. And finally, the Islamic tradition of stories of the prophets connects Adam's redemption with the building of the sanctuary in Mecca and the performance of rites there by later believers, including the circumambulation of the Kaaba and the offering of prayer. When a narrative about a past event is used to explain why a ritual is performed in the present, and often to lend the present performance authority and efficacy, that narrative is known as a mythological precedent. Note that the word mythological here does not have the connotation of lacking historicity. A good example of a mythological precedent is the story of the Last Supper in the Gospels which provides an explanation, authority, and efficacy to the sacrament. It is likely that all of these narratives are similar, at least in part, because they were written to serve in a similar way as mythological precedents for rituals. The likeness in function gives rise to a likeness in form. The interpretation of these texts as mythological precedents does not exclude explanations based on common ancestry or derivation. What it does, however, is permit an analysis of the content of these narratives in terms of how they relate to implied contexts, skirting the potential pitfalls of speculative textual histories. The Book of Moses is especially informative because the context in which the text was revealed is actually evident in contemporary sources including original manuscripts and accounts of the translation process. Thus, the study of the Book of Moses paves the way for studies of other ancient narratives whose contexts are less directly evident. This investigation of the typology of religious narratives suggests the need for a deeper engagement both with the revealed ancient scripture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and with ancient, ancient uh, narrative literature in general. I believe that this brief study outlines a way in which scholars of diverse persuasions can successfully meet in dialogue about these texts. Thank you. Thank you, David. 
are are you connected with us now? Uh, yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, a, a, a clarification and then a question. Uh, the intertextual stemma model has to do with the origin of a text, that is its uh, genealogy, while the typological model has to do with how the text is used in a given society. So uh, first of all, clarify whether that's right. And then the question is, does the typological model ever give clues uh, to help in understanding an intertextual connection? Uh, just to, before I answer the first part of the question, just to repeat, to, so the last part of the question is, does the typological model help to clarify intertextual relationships? Correct. Okay. So yes, uh, so yes, the, your your uh, your summary is is essentially correct. So the intertextual uh, stemma model also is all about. Um, uh, finer relationships between the texts, the history of the text overall, uh, between its origins and its uh, and its current exemplars that we have access to now. Um, and and so, in fact, the the title of this conference about tracing ancient threads is strongly evocative of that uh, intertextual stemma model. That's what it's about: is tracing the intertextual threads through the sources. Um, and and yes, in fact, the typological model uh, does uh, it does contribute to an understanding of the intertextuality uh, simply because it helps to situate uh, the various um, stages of the text historically and and in a concrete context in the society. So it uh, it helps to clarify. Um, how texts would have been accessible to different copyists and readers, and and it also helps to clarify the mode in which it could have been passed down uh, or copied from one uh, one example to another. Okay, um, you you stated that you want to skirt the potential pitfalls of speculative textual histories. Does that? Uh, apply strictly to connections with the Book of Moses, or um, does it include all of these possible connections on your texts? Well, I fully acknowledge that that these texts uh, could be related genetically. And and in fact, I mean, from a, from a belief standpoint, I believe that the Book of Moses is an ancient text um, that, uh, that probably predates a lot of the examples that I'm talking about. Uh, in this presentation, um, but but yes, the problem is that uh, we just lack a lot of information about how all these apocryphal texts and the Book of Moses are related to each other. And part of the problem is that um, a lot of these apocryphal texts themselves are imperfectly understood in terms of their textual history. Uh, there are a lot of gaps. Uh, there would have been texts that would have uh, served as intermediaries for the the intertextuality uh, that we don't have. Um, in some cases, we're not really sure how old certain motifs are that appear in the apocryphal texts, um, and and the Book of Moses itself is difficult to place historically because uh, although some of the papers in this conference so far um, uh, have have made great strides in that direction already of understanding, you know, where the Book of Moses belongs historically. Um, we just don't know, and Joseph Smith never really specified um, when the Book of Moses was written, when it was first written. Was it, you know, was it written by Moses himself? Is it, uh, it's, it, it speaks of Moses in the third person, which suggests that perhaps it, uh, it was written a little after Moses' time. Um, and uh, and it's just difficult to say uh, where it belongs historically. Um, uh, something else I was going to say about that I can't remember now. But yeah, that's that's essentially. Oh yeah, the 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 intertextuality of Moses itself is a little complicated because, um, as we know from Joseph Smith's uh, process of creating the uh, the Joseph Smith translation, 
In some cases, he was, uh, he was adding commentary to the text. In some cases, he was clarifying things doctrinally. And in some cases, he was revealing totally new textual uh, narrative. Um, and, and so th there's just a complication to it that makes the Book of Moses difficult to, uh, to evaluate in an intertextual stemma model. Of the text that you analyzed, is, is there any real way with any of them to explain why they were written? Is, do, we have, do we have that kind of information or do we just try to draw conclusions based on the content of the text? That's right. The, the best thing that we have to go on in most cases is a close reading of the, of the text themselves and, uh, and trying to determine based on the topics that are focused on and the structure of the narratives, um, how they would have been used in society. Um, so yeah, and, and then just uh, creating plausible, um, plausible explanations for those features um, based, on, <clears throat> based on historical um, context that could have existed. Uh, thank you. I think we have reason to believe that that is a more of an art than a science to try to determine that. It is. It is. But at least we have a text there. And, uh, and part of my point uh, in this presentation is that, uh, is that the Book of Moses provides a very, uh, a very exciting contribution to this whole discussion about typological uh, relationships, because uh, we know a lot more about how the Book of Moses was created and, uh, and the historical context in which it was created. And I mean the 19th century context in which Joseph Smith revealed the text. Um, we know a lot more about that than we do about the Apocrypha and how they were created. And so in a sense, the Book of Moses can provide a model for understanding at least our, our uh, our range of possibilities for, um, or, at the, or at least understanding a possibility for a context in which many of the Apocrypha could have been created. And, and I think especially these examples I'm talking about here, uh, <clears throat> such as Sefer Raziel, the conflict of Adam and Eve, uh, to a lesser extent al Kisai, but, uh, but certainly those first two, and the Book of Jubilees, um, I think they fit rather well in a context very similar to Joseph Smith's revelation of the Book of Moses. Uh, you mentioned that um, you selected the passages to examine based on your areas of expertise. So Judaism, Eastern Christianity, and Islam. Are there similar texts that come from other cultures uh, that could have been included, including Latin, European texts, and so forth. Yes, there are. I'm sure there are, and uh, and it's just that I I don't consider myself qualified enough to speak in detail about those other uh, those other possibilities. But uh, but yes, I know there are other uh, parallel situations in uh, in Hindu literature, Chinese literature. Uh, in Latin, as you mentioned, uh, in Ethiopic literature, and uh, in other cases, too. Uh, you mentioned that mythological precedent um, means that texts were written to explain a ritual practice that already exists. Uh, did I understand that correctly? Well, yeah, that's a chicken and egg question, whether the ritual comes first or the narrative. Uh, both could actually be true. I mean, you can even write a, uh, I mean, <clears throat> speaking in purely hypothetical terms, you can write a, uh, a, a mythological precedent narrative without even having a ritual that goes with it. Uh, you can write such a narrative in order to propound that such a ritual should exist or to, to kind of argue that an existing ritual should be modified so that it's more like this narrative. In other words, Adam or whatever ancient figure, Moses or Abraham, did it this way 
and we should be doing it that way too, even though that's not what we're doing. Um, so all of those are, are hypothetical possibilities, but, uh, but yeah, so th there's, no, there's no necessary relationship there uh, of ritual preceding the narrative. Uh, does does the narrative ever um, change the ritual that preceded it? Uh, kind of an esoteric question. For for example, Adam Adam builds the Kaaba in your text, but in other Islamic understanding, it's Abraham and Ishmael who build the the Kaaba. Uh, are there previous Islamic traditions that have Adam as the one who builds the Kaaba in Mecca. Yeah, th this, uh, this theme actually runs throughout the, um, throughout the Qisas al Anbiya' literature and is found in Tafsir as well. Um, and so, uh, for example, Ishaq ibn Bishr, who writes uh, about, about 800 AD, um, he, uh, he also contain, he also has uh, has this same motif in in his uh, stories of the prophets um so yeah that it uh it does it does appear and uh and certainly th there's um so yes there's the tradition about abraham building uh the kaaba um but both could be true so adam could have built it and then abraham rebuilt it um so so yeah th there's uh uh and and in terms of the relationship to the ritual, um, so yeah, I, I mean, both of these both of these narrative accounts could uh, coincide with the rituals performed uh, in the Hajj. Uh, so, so there, I think it's all kind of one uh, harmonious. Uh, there's a, harm, a harmony there between the narratives and the ritual. 